Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Hillary. I work for MOFCA, and um, Edgar Evenkeel is going to be giving this webinar tonight all about caring for your trees. Um, but before, before we go any further, I would like to acknowledge that I myself am coming to you all from Wabanaki land. Um, I am in South Portland and that the Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association is based on Wabanaki land in Unity, Maine, where we manage a forest, farmland and several different orchards. Um, the Wabanaki are the people of the Dawn land, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the Abenaki, the Maliseet, the Mi'kmaq, the Passamaquoddy and the Penobscot. Um, and I myself, and then more generally here at Mafka, we, we acknowledge that Mafka is intertwined with colonialist histories, many of the principles and practices of organic agriculture and organic orcharding um, have their roots in thousands of years of indigenous knowledge from around the world. And we're in the process of coming to terms with what this means for our work, which is on and, and about land. We're working to come to terms with, with what the impacts of colonization have, have been and how we can take steps organizationally and also individually toward making reparations. And so, um, oh, Edgar, if you wanna to click to the next slide, that would be great. Sure. Um, some of the organizations that we've been working with are listed here, and I'm gonna share some links to the work that they do um, in the follow-up email so that anyone who's interested can, sure. can learn a bit more. Um, and oh, that last website that listed, if you're coming, you know, if you're coming to this gathering from somewhere else and you're curious um, whose land you're on, you can visit that website. It's really interesting. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, Edgar, thank you. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to just take a quick opportunity to plug a couple of events that we have coming up at Mafka. Some of these relate to orcharding and fruit tree care, and some of them don't. Um, next week, we're having a sort of a second webinar in this mini series, I guess. So Edgar's talking about sort of low intervention fruit tree care. And Laura Seeger next week is going to talk about some of the holistic practices that she uses at Mafka's Orchards, which are more intensive. So involve a, a wide range of organic sprays. So um, you may or may not be interested in that, but it's... Uh, also uh, offered on a sliding scale and you can sign up on our website and it's also online. Um, there's also a tour of the Maine Heritage Orchard if you're in the vicinity of Unity on the 22nd. And then these are two other events that we're hosting this summer. One in Unity, which will in include some heyday, it's called. It has some focus on fruit trees and there's an apple ladder building component, um, but it's sort of like a fun free event pretty low key on the Mafka grounds with like food and a lot of different skill building workshops. And then in August, we're hosting Maine Apple Camp in West Gardener. So this is like a weekend camp for people who love apples. Um, it's really fun. And we're having it at a new location this year, which is supposed to be really comfortable and have great swimming. And we're going to have a whole ton of interesting talks about cider making and orchard care and all kinds of other stuff. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's all I'll say about upcoming events. Um, so yeah, I'm pleased again to, to introduce Edgar. I want to just say that Edgar is a certified arborist with a bachelor of science degree in plant, soil, and insect science from UMass Amherst. He grew up in coastal Massachusetts, but now he lives in Surrey, Maine, um, with his partner, Liz, their dog, Dagger, and their Maine Coon cat. And um, Edgar loves to climb trees near the ocean and eat fresh fruit, as I'm sure we all do. And maybe that's part of what brings many of you here tonight. Um, so Edgar, I'm going to stop talking and you can get going whenever you're ready. Okay, cool. That sounds good. Thank you so much for the introduction, Hillary. Um, uh, I am feel a little overwhelmed with how many people have uh, registered for this webinar workshop today, but I am grateful for Hillary's companionship. She's an awesome uh, workshop moderator. I've gotten to work with her over the last few years. So you all are in good company. If I get uh, lost in my presentation or distracted, I have a bad habit of going down wormholes and can get 
go off on weird tangents about other stuff. I mean, all related to fruit trees and orchards, but feel free to just like uh, call me out. Um, but this is a pretty dense presentation. Um, there's a lot of information to cover. Uh, I will start by saying that um, fruit trees are really cool. <laughs> and that's like such a basic statement, but I mean, they're my favorite thing. Uh, they are, you know, growing fruit trees and taking care of trees and meeting and connecting with other people through their care and passion and interest and enthusiasm for trees and the products that come from them has uh, become a major part of my life. And so over the last uh, 12 years that I've been really engaging with you know, learning about fruit trees, what's happening on the surface, what's happening under the surface, and, you know, uh, getting to know them with my hands and climbing into them. I've been, it, part of my learning process is to share the knowledge that I've gained, both from firsthand experience, experiences and from some of my teachers and mentors with other folks. So uh, I want to thank all of you all for giving me a chance to share all of my crazy brain information with you. Um, it's probably going to be a lot. You're going to walk, go walk away from the end of this workshop being like, that dude knows a lot of stuff. I don't know how that all fits in his brain. I do want you to know that like, I'm a professional. I care about this stuff. I'm also human. I make mistakes. Uh, I'm not like a master anything. So it's possible that I may give you a piece of information in this uh, webinar workshop and it may be contrary to something that you've learned somewhere else. That's okay. Like uh, growing fruit trees is like, there's an art and a science and also a personal connection, uh, you know, about it. So the way that you may decide to prune or fertilize or however you interact with your trees uh, may be a different approach than the way that I would take or recommend but I just like to give people all of the options since I've been studying, you know, the somewhat, you know, uh, the uh, what I would call the standard approach, the standard um, from, you know, uh, so cooperative extension, I've learned a lot from that. But let me just back up and say, so here's the table of contents. This is broadly what I'm going to share with you today. And we're going to go deeper into some of these topics. We might not have time to go all the way through and out the other side, um, but we'll cover as much as we can. If you have a question, you can type it into the chat anytime during the chat, and I will get around to answering questions after I've shared all of the information with you from the slides that I put together. So um, first of all, growing fruit trees should be fun. Um, there's a lot to know, but just like from the first time when you go to somebody else's orchard, pick a piece of fruit off of their tree, and it's wonderful. You go to the nursery, you read the Fedco catalog with the descriptions of all of the different varieties of apples and peaches and pears and grapes and blueberries and all of the companion plants that you can plant along with that. Like, it's just, it makes you feel good. So I always try to remember that even when I'm, you know, f uh, facing a problem in an orchard or looking at somebody's tree and trying to figure out like, what's going on? Why is this tree sad? Why isn't it growing well? Why is it declining? So uh, I always come back to that. But fruit trees are living things, so we should treat them with respect and care and tenderness. And it is possible that through some of our good intentions, it is possible to harm a tree if you over fertilize it or drown it in water, plant it in the wrong place, make a pruning cut, on a certain part of the tree that every cut the tree is going to respond a certain way um even in the act of grafting fruit trees when you cut the top off of that rootstock you're really stressing it out and you're asking it to recover and grow a new head so um if you know once you spend some time with these trees and get to know them uh you can improve your success in taking care of them but you might go out one day and your favorite tree is just dead and you don't know why. And you can kind of do some forensics to figure that out. Um, but the important thing is what John Bunker told me is like, 
this is about preserving this uh, school of thought and knowledge like the uppercase orchard. It's not about your home orchard or my home or orchard or this one tree, but like this whole body of knowledge that brings people together that we've co evolved with these plants over a long time. Um, so um, I've had a lot of great teachers over the years. I've learned a lot from Michael Phillips. It's a sad thing that he passed away back in February. Um, a lot of people had a positive uh, influence from him and his books and his workshops I personally did and we're still as Michael would say like we're still at the tip of the iceberg and we're, he would say we're still just children in kindergarten we're just learning and making the mistakes on, along the way we think we're experts and we know everything but we don't we really don't and it takes a whole lifetime uh, of you know digging in the dirt and living with these plants before you really know you know like the best way to care for them. Um, I subscribe to the, I'm a member of the Main State Pomological Society, which is a great organization if you care about fruit trees. You don't have to be a commercial orchardist to become a part of it. Um, the uh, Cooperative Extension Agents in uh, Orono and Monmouth um, send out a frequent newsletter that just talks about Going, goings on in the orchard with primarily a focus on apples. They talk about peaches and cherries and pears and blueberries a little bit too. I mean, the low bush blueberries is a whole different thing, but but um, it's interesting like watching, like for example, how the weather changes. So like this year uh, we're having, it's been an unseasonably dry springtime and that's kind of affecting how plants are growing coming out of their winter dormancy. So um, I don't know if everybody knows what Niwa is, but it is basically there are weather stations around the country and there's an online database and you can log into it and it will give you growing degree day models of what insects and diseases are moving and their life stage development. And having access to that information can help you, give you a heads up on like, oh, I should be looking out for this pest or disease or planning for this event in the orchard. So I say the term phenology is um, the study of how plants and na natural processes uh, grow and evolve over the course of the season. So like dorm winter dormancy, spring bud break, bud swell, um, you know, leaf uh, canopy emergence, flowering, uh, pink tip blossom, full bloom, petal fall, uh, fruit set, all of these things that are happening on fruit trees when they wake up from their winter hibernation. And springtime is a pretty important time for um, working with your fruit trees, taking care of them, um, just doing a lot of observation. Like you can see like some branches leaf out earlier than others. Is it a north side? Is it a south side? Is it a windy side? Is it a sheltered side? Is it a dry side? Was there some kind of disturbance? Uh, did a, a deer or wildlife, an animal um, scratch or rub or girdle your tree over the winter and you're only just noticing the effects now. So, and then, you know, going throughout the course of the season as the fruit sets and uh, hopefully so ripens and sizes up to maturity leading to harvest in the fall. Um, this book is amazing. Uh, if you haven't read it, I strongly recommend you check it out, uh, Understanding Roots. In my pruning workshops, I talk about how the top of the tree is just the tip of the iceberg and what's going on underground is uh, biologically more important for the health of the tree or really any plant. I mean, in this book, he talks about vegetable culture, forestry, um, and there's just really, it's fascinating to look at some of these cross-section illustrations based on actual um, like excavations of trees and plants to see how their roots were growing in different soil types. Um, this slide represents uh, tree morphology and, you know, soil root um, uh, relationships. Uh, so if you aren't, um, you know, know, this helps you know the 
terminology and the words to describe different parts of a tree. Pretty much all different species of trees have these primary parts. Um, and so it helps us talk about like what's going good with your tree, what's wrong with your tree, like which part of the tree. Some people, you know, like uh, some approaches to orcharding, you might prune to remove all of the root suckers. Some folks would prefer to leave the root suckers. There's pros and cons of each. Uh, it's not black and white. You don't have to do 100% every year. The trees are living, evolving organisms and we can work with them and watch how they grow and see how when we make uh, interactions and whether with our pruning tools or our watering, fertilizing, um, different management strategies that we take with the trees um, can affect how, whether the tree is going to be doing focusing its energy on vegetative growth or reproductive growth. And but by vegetative and reproductive growth, I mean, is it growing leaves and shoots and roots and like branching out and focusing on its own health and establishment in its soil and climate conditions? Or is it focusing on reproduction and uh, trying to ripen up fruit so that it can, the tree is genetic, all, all fruit trees are genetically programmed to produce seeds and to do seed dispersal. Like that is their highest good is to make more seeds and spread them out across the world, whether it be by wind or wildlife, birds, squirrels, coyotes, humans, wild horses, bears, whatever it be, the goal of any fruit tree or fruiting plant uh, is to have those seeds carried away, planted, germinated, and the next generation of plants growing. Um, our, in our um, domesticated agriculture, we have selectively bred fruit trees over the last thousands of years since before Roman times to uh, select for traits that we, uh, we found, you know, grew healthier, more productive, higher quality uh, crops over time. So trees with better root anchorage that don't blow over from the wind, trees that are longer lived, trees that uh, bear fruit at a younger age. Um, so these are all characteristics that we have selected for. Um, now, I'm, <laughs> let me back up and say, if you don't know this, all fruit trees are grafted, a scion cultivar is selected and spliced onto a rootstock, whether bench grafting, uh, field grafting, um, dormant grafting or summer budding. There's many def different techniques to achieve vegetative propagation of a new tree. Um, but part of the front fun of growing fruit is growing fruit fr plants from seed. So if you eat a blueberry or a strawberry or an apple or a peach and you save that pit and you're able to stratify it and germinate it and grow a new plant, that's your own new unique variety uh, that you have selected for. And it may be uh, wonderful and flavorful and sweet and crunchy, or it may be a spitter um, and inedible and dries your mouth out with tannins. Uh, it may be good for using for utility, but um, not necessarily. So let me back up here. Um, when we're watching the times of the spring, people ask me like, oh, Edgar, like, is it too late to plant a tree? Like, can I, do I have to wait until next year? And I say, you can plant a tree at any time of the year that you can dig a hole in the ground. Whether, even if the ground is thawed out in the winter, you could plant, you could transplant a tree then if you wanted to. Spring and fall are the optimal times to do it. Uh, you can plant trees in the middle of summer. You just have to irrigate them more. Uh, you, there, there's a greater risk that the trees will, the roots will dry out. They'll suffer greater transplant shock. So if you're able to keep a tree in a container during the summer and or keep healed in in a temporary shel shel sheltered location, plant it in the fall. Um, but it's important to, you know, like handle the roots with care. If you buy a container grown tree, really break open that root ball when you uh, get that plant from the nursery. A lot of uh, tree roots end up getting root bound and growing in circles. 
And when the tree gets established in its new location, it will strangle itself um, and have self-girdling roots. So uh, spreading out the roots is important. And then like this, then there, this is a total area that's up for debate. Do you incorporate compost and fertilizer and soil amendments into your tree planting hole? Or do you dig a hole and just plant the tree in native soil and do no fertilization for the first year and just let the tree get established in its place? I've done both. I've seen trees be successful with purely just native plantings, native soil, no amendments. I've seen them, uh, you know, still linger along and not really take off and grow vigorously with adding amendments. So uh, the most important thing is just making sure that the tree's roots don't dry out, keeping them moist and irrigated. Um, here I was talking about. Uh, grafting and vegetative propagation, uh, knowing what size, what rootstock your tree is grafted on. Uh, apples, there's the most choices of rootstocks, but pears have different options for rootstocks. Peaches, plum, stone fruit all have different options for rootstock. Quinces, um, the rootstocks have been selectively selectively bred for qualities of anchorage, adaptability to different soil types, uh, size of the mature tree, precocity or age of bearing, um, and eat like uh, certain rootstocks can even influence nutrient uptake and transfer into the fruit. And so the same cultivar of tree grafted in the same soil on two different rootstocks can potentially have a different phenotype when the fruit is ripened, depending on the type of rootstock that is grafted to. So that's a really fun thing to watch and observe. Um, I, I love standard trees, seedling trees. Uh, trees granted, grafted on Antonovka or seedling apple rootstock, big old long-lived trees. Uh, they're not quite as manageable. I recommend if you're going to start planting a new orchard, um, if you want it, ask yourself, who am I planting these trees for? Is this for me to enjoy the fruit or is this for my children and grandchildren and the next generation? Trees grafted on dwarf root stock are gonna be much easier to prune and, and uh, take care, manage pests and diseases and harvest from uh, tree and they will come into fruit yielding at a younger age but um fruit you know there's something to be said about a 100 plus year old tree growing on the edge of an old stone wall or foundation or out in a field and going to experience the fruit that the previous generation was uh enjoying um, something else to be said about the size of the tree that it's grafted on is that larger trees have less photosynthetic efficiency. The outer canopy is going to get more sunlight exposure and the inner canopy is going to have more shade. And you will notice that the fruit on the outer canopy, particularly on the south side of the tree, is going to ripen up to full color and sugar sooner than particularly the north side of the tree or the inner canopy may never, if it's a uh, uh, yellow or red fat fleshed, yellow or red skinned fruit, it may st stay green on the inner canopy. So that's just something to take account. I'm not telling you not to plant standard trees. You should find a place, plant standard trees to grow for genetic preservation. I mean, that's the goal of a, um, a heritage orchard is genetic preservation, taking care of these cultivars that we've been selecting for for generations and keeping them alive and available for the next generation. So there's something to be said in the value of that. Um, I keep saying water, you don't want the roots to dry out on your trees. This time of year, I don't, uh, I'm not sure about, um, I'll say where I live, it's been incredibly dry since mid-April and windy and the soil is uh, pretty dry. I mean, it's not hard and cracking yet, but uh, there's not adequate water to absorb soil nutrients to go be taken up by plant roots. 
So we are already irrigating our fruit trees and vegetable gardens. Uh, I will back up and say, I'm telling you about all of these things that you can do to take care of your trees. There's so many things you're never gonna have time to do everything. If you are able to set up budget for a automated or um, you know, like a drip irrigation system, and all you have to do, you can either set it on a timer or just turn the nozzle and the water will flow directly to the tree's root zone. That's going to reduce your time commitment and physical labor to taking care of these trees. But you know, uh, new, newly planted fruit trees are gonna want at least five, I mean, 10 to 15 gallons of water a week through the whole growing season. And if you're not getting inches of precipitation, you're going to have to go out with the hose or the watering can. Or if you're in a place where there's no well water access, you're going to have to pump or draw water from a well, set up some kind of pond pump system, um, bringing water to treat to plants and gardens. Um, it's one of the most important things for growing food. And it's also one of the most difficult things if you don't have an efficient system to do it. I have carried countless five gallon buckets of water to plants to take care of them. Um, and sometimes it's just, that's the labor of love. That's something that you have to do. Um, so I'm talking about soil health now. Um, All of the, I'm, I'm not a salesman. I'm, I don't work for any of these companies, but I'm going to show you a lot of products that I purchase. I recommend these are products that are proven to uh, grow healthy trees and plants. Um, I make a lot of compost at home. I have kitchen waste compost. I have forest compost. I have a special fungal mushroom compost and I have livestock manure compost. All of these different kinds of composts are going to have different balances of beneficial microorganisms, uh, microscopic fungi, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, and mycorrhiza, um, uh, decomposing facultative uh, fungi. There's numerous beneficial microorganisms living in the soil root zone around the trees. And those are like the without living soil, you will not be able to grow food. All you'll be able to do is grow weeds uh, by enlivening soil and bringing life to the soil by biologically active compost. That's the best way that we can grow healthy food to, to transfer those calories and energy for our own sustenance and those uh, nut uh, mineral, my, the macronutrients and micronutrients trace minerals that are in the soil uh, are brought by those living organisms to the into the different parts of the plants and help with the growth of the different parts of the plants like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, all go into new branch growth, shoot growth, leaf growth, make photosynthesis possible so that calcium, boron, zinc, manganese, and molybdenum can all be brought up into healthy cell wall structure and that without all of these things, you're going to just have a fruit with no skin that just melts. Having all of those micronutrients is what creates the sweet crunch of biting into an apple, the sweet taste, uh, the softness when you break through the skin of a fuzzy peach in July, end of July and August. All of this, all of the things that manifest into the wonderful eating experience of the fruit comes from what's in the soil. So if you don't make compost at home, for whatever reason you're not able to, that's okay. That you can buy compost um, from a, there's small compost making makers around the country. You can seek them out. I look for uh, compost from people who make it, who have their composted test 
tested and tell you what the nutrient analysis is, if there's any herbicide residue in it, if there's any contaminants, because that can be you can, that can be imported into your garden and orchard soil. Uh, and so we're not looking to bring contaminants, weed seeds, pathogens into our soil. Um, so I use these products, I buy compost, I make compost. Um, so that, that is one of the ingredients in growing healthy fruit. Um, I have been learning about biochar for a couple of years. I've started using it. Uh, it's a little bit of a controversial thing. Like, why should I add this? There's some studies that uh, have shown that uh, certain uh, concentrations of biochar have the potential to reduce plant growth in farms and gardens. Um, so it's one of those things where a little bit goes a long way. With a lot of these things like less than 10%, less than 5% of your total volume is going to have big benefits. Um, and you can accelerate the soil or uh, the root zone environment by inoculating your biochar with compost tea and beneficial microbes before you apply it. Um, the, some of these products, effective microbes, uh, Fedco's fruition mix, which has, or sorry, the worm castings, we'll get back to that. Um, but with fruit trees, when I'm fertilizing, uh, I seek out low nitrogen fertilizers. If you apply excessive nitrogen to fruit trees, you'll have uh, overly vigorous shoot growth. And that shoot growth is more susceptible to insects and diseases who want to come and eat the leaves and eat the set and drink the sap from the young succulent growth on your trees. So I seek out low nitrogen fertilizers, um, fish and seaweed diluted, uh, but worm castings is, um, oh, I'm going too far forward. Let me back up. Sorry. Worm castings is less a half of a one, a half of a percent of nitrogen, a good balance. So, I mean, and that has to be blended in with other soil amendments, but doing Doing soil amendment, amending is something that we're looking at doing early in the year. So um, as early in the year after the snow melts and the ground dries up a little bit, but it's still moist, if I always ask people, if you haven't taken a soil sample and gotten soil test analysis from your fruit tree growing your orchard, home orchard area, I strongly recommend that you do that. I see... Um, soil nutrients, macronutrient and micronutrients all over the place. Excessive, above optimum, low, deficient. These imbalances uh, can affect the health, growth, productivity, and resilience of insect pests and diseases. So knowing what's going on in your soil is going to give you important information that will help you appropriately fertilize and amend your crops. Um, you know, and it's possible, like it's, po this test is showing very low nitrogen, but it's showing medium phosphorus, high potassium, high calcium. So a little bit of worm castings is going to boost that nitrogen into a range where there will be a more balanced nutrient presence uptake. In most of New England's soils, there is plentiful, adequate iron um, and other minerals, um, but the limiting factors are often zinc and boron. Those are most off, those are the most commonly uh, deficient mineral nutrients in farm and garden soils. And though uh, conveniently those nutrient, those minerals are readily available in seaweed. So, um, where I live on the coast, I can drive down to the causeway, pull my pickup truck up and load it up with fish totes of seaweed and bring that and mulch around the 
root zone and soil area of all of my trees and gardens. For some folks that are inland and uh, you know can't don't have ready, ready access to fresh seaweed, you can buy seaweed fertilizer products, um, and I've used those effectively. Um, they come in a concentrated liquid form or a dried, uh, what is that called? Not flake, but like a powder, seaweed powder. Um, and oftentimes it's more cost effective to buy a dry form of the product. So you're not paying for the water and shipping. And then you get the concentrated powder and add water to it when you're applying it to your trees and gardens. Hey Edgar, is it fair yes. to say then that there are there aren't any downsides to mulching with a lot of seaweed? So once again, uh, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. Some folks have said that it's possible that there could be microplastics. There can be pathogens after a storm if there's a lot of uh, like septic water that's flowing down rivers and into coastlands. So you just have to be careful. Uh, about how much you add. I put a thin layer of seaweed down um, when I'm mulching my trees and gardens, and I haven't seen any negative effects happening from that. Great. And I think I'll just throw in one other question about adding fertilizer. Yeah. Um, John says that he thinks Michael Phillips has said that he preferred not to add any compost in the planting hole that that might discourage roots from dividing, diving deep, sorry, and sure. setting up extensive root systems. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yeah. So Michael said that and that worked for him. And like I said, I've planted trees that did perfectly fine in just native soil. Once again, if you know that you're going to plant fruit trees in that location, it, the best management practice is to take a soil sample a year in advance, get the test results, see what's going in the soil where you're going to plant your trees, make apply your amendments, and like particularly if you find that your soil is extremely acidic, like in a let's say a blueberry field range of 5.5, or highly alkaline like over seven to uh, seven pH, fruit trees ideal optimal soil pH range is as close to 6.5 as you can get it, six to seven. So if you have soil that's more acidic than six, like in the five to six range, you're definitely gonna wanna add calcium lime, some form of lime to buffer the pH, to raise the pH before you plant the trees. That's gonna make all of the nutrients and minerals that are already present in the soil more available to the roots. A lot of people, most people don't think don't think about it a year ahead. They order the trees, they put it in and Godspeed like, and trees do fine. Like they don't really need us. I mean, they just need us to put, to put them where they are. Um, it, hopefully it's ideal situation where they're not gonna drown, you know, in a floodplain or something like that. That being said, I can't under, understate the importance of performing a, soil test um, at least once during your relationship with your fruit trees. Um, if, you're if you never do it and you just add a little bit of good stuff every year, chances are it could be fine. Uh, as an arborist, uh, thinking out, like stepping back from just orchards and thinking about trees in general, like for like, there's no such thing as one single solitary tree out in the open, freestanding tree with no other trees around it, like out in a field, anywhere in nature. It just doesn't exist. Like trees grow in groups. They grow in clumps and clusters. They grow with taller, taller, like small trees grow with tall trees, bushes, understory. So if you are able to design your planting so that you have companion plants uh, with comparable uh, cultural requirements. Um, and, you know, like that's something that happens in permaculture and polyculture plantings. Uh, we'll talk about Bunk's Fed Co, uh, John Bunker's um, functional orchard in a little bit, which is a cool example, or like uh, Miracle Farms uh, permaculture polyculture orchard in Quebec, um, where different species of plants, instead of just having a monoculture of, you know, like a you know, a hundred acres of just, just apples, of just cosmic crisp apple, you know, like that planting is gonna require like 
TLC uh, it's going to live on drip. It's going to need steroids its whole life to be healthy and productive. Whereas if you go in the forest and you see there's spruce trees, fir trees, red oaks, red maples, white birch, yellow birch, ironwood, um, black cherry, like all different uh, a diversity of species, um, you're going to in general have healthier trees. So that's something, something to think about when you're planting trees or you already have an existing tree, um, consider planting companion plants, uh, trees and shrubs, um, so that your tree has a relationship, a friend, uh, someone to hold hands with underground and share nutrients with. It will make for healthier plants. It is possible to plant trees too close together. Um, But yeah, that's just something that you have to figure out. What do you have enough space for in your landscape? Uh, what feels good and what do you like and your own tastes? Um, hey Edgar, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Just while we're in this moment, it is already 6.15 amazingly. So just wanted to give you- Where a does the time, time go? <laughs> I guess I'll say like, uh, Michael didn't, Michael said, don't put any compost in your planting hole. I've seen uh, trees that were planted in like, heavy cow manure in the planting hole and that young tree really takes off. So it's a whole it's a whole spectrum. You could put no amendments in your planting hole. You could put a lot of manure and compost. Um, as long as you're continuing to take care, irrigate water, keep an eye on the tree, keep down the weeds and brush, um, particularly sodden grass. Um, you know, it's, there's no right or wrong answer. You're not going to kill a tree or set it back hard by planting it in with like one cubic, one cubic yard or one, sorry, one cubic foot of compost in the planting hole is not going to handicap that tree for the rest of its life. Um, so, I mean, when I plant a tree, I dig out the native soil. I personally will mix in like a half of a cubic foot and like that, that's just what I'm comfortable with. That's what I've seen work depending on, is it a clay loam, a silt loam, a sandy loam, some, and that's where particularly, so the way that you make that decision is when you look at your soil test analysis, and if you are able to, it will say on there, what is the organic matter content? Uh, it says it right there, second line, 5.7. So that's a decent, that's a medium amount. The ideal, the optimal range for soil organic matter is going to be around eight. Uh, any too much higher than that, you have the potential uh, for for an anaerobic soil. There's not enough cation exchange capacity to deliver the nutrients to the tree's roots, but somewhere in the range of five to eight is good is a good range for organic matter. So you can calculate how much organic matter, compost is organic matter to add to your planting or to amend your plant, your orchard field with based on the existing organic matter percentage. So uh, some people use, uh, so Michael and other el others talk about mycorrhizal fungi as a beneficial symbiosis with trees roots. I know some orchardists and nurserymen who have never messed around with that stuff. They don't need it. The trees grow fine. They have good soil already um, prepared. Uh, if you have a soil that has been uh, degraded and Im heavily impacted by human activity or machinery, you're going to want to bring life back into the soil. And most, not all plants, but many plants in different species have pre existing relationships with mycorrhizal fungi and other beneficial bacteria and microorganisms. So, by using this product, it's just one tool that you have the option to use to bring life into your soil. Um, and there's no, no particular time of year when it, it's never too late to add that stuff. It's uh, inadvisable to apply a nitrogen fertilizer. And depending on who you ask, some folks would say 
after, Ju after June 1st, it's too late. Some folks would say July 15th. You just have to be careful with over nitro over fertilizing your soil with nitrogen because it's like giving candy to a toddler before bedtime. Those trees are not going to go into dormancy and they'll be more susceptible to winter uh, cold damage uh, injury. Um, cool. Uh, so when I plant a tree, this is what it looks like, uh, how I plant a tree. I dig the hole, I dig a wide hole, a deep hole, a hole that has plenty of room for me to spread the roots out. And I can incorporate a little bit of compost into that surrounding soil. Um, and then I top, I put a layer of mulch, wood chip mulch, aged wood chip mulch on top of that to keep the uh, bare, the bare soil from drying out from evaporation that will help keep the soil moist. And uh, by adding that mulch to the top of the soil, that's a form of organic matter that can uh, create habitat for beneficial microbes. I also put a um, circle uh, of uh, pea stone gravel right around the base of the trunk of the tree. So that deters moles, voles and rabbits and uh, uh, apple trunk borers. And then I paint a layer of whitewash and neem oil, diluted neem oil on the trunk of the tree um, to deter the round headed apple borers from uh, girdling the tree. And if the eggs of the borers do get laid, it's more noticeable because that whitewash is there. Um, it's more visible to see the frass and then you can take management matters into your own hands. I use hardware cloth mesh tree guards to protect from rabbits and voles. Uh, my friend planted a bunch of apple trees and used this PVC tree guard and when he took it off at the end of the winter because the snow had got, gotten piled up uh, you know, above that PVC tree guard, the vole just came and ate all of the bark off the inside. So that is like, would have been a two-year-old tree that got killed before it was able to turn anything. So kind of sad, has to be replanted. Uh, that's less likely to happen with these uh, hardware cloth mesh tree guards, but it's always good to go out and stomp down the snow around the trunks of your trees. Um, in the winter when the snow piles high. Um, I, I like using these tools for removing um, grass and sod around the trunk of my tree. The grass and the sod creates habitat for the uh, moles and voles. I don't like this clean cultivation method. I mean, that is designed to prevent competition with weeds and grass from nutrients, but that soil is gonna dry out and those trees are gonna be unhappy. You're gonna have to irrigate more heavily. So orchard vineyard nursery mix has clover and fescue and uh, creeping ryegrass fescue uh, by having a diversity of grass, um, you know, in, in your orchard around your trees, uh, the clover fixes, has bacteria that fix nitrogen and ultimately you're going to, you know, if you keep the grass 18 inches away from the trunk of your tree, you're gonna have less uh, issues with pests um, girdling the trunks of your trees. And then I have a scythe. I got tired of gassing up my weed whacker. So I just mow the grass around the trunks of my trees. I'm less likely to cut and damage the trunk because the, you know, one side of the scythe blade is sharp and one side is dull. And it's just like, for me, it's like Tai Chi, like going out and mowing the grass using a scythe. Um, you know, it's different. It's not, that's not, for everyone, but if you're into it, it's something that I like to do. Uh, I've learned a lot from these books, Seb Holzer's Permaculture and Restoration Agriculture, and I like Mark Shepard's approach. I'm talking about all the things you could do. You could spend a bunch of money taking care of your fruit trees. Mark Shepard says plant them and stun them. Like, don't even look at them. Sheer, total, utter neglect. If, you know, survival of the fittest. If they live, they live. They die, they die. You know, you don't want to spend, lose your, lose sleep uh, over whether your tree is going, your fruit trees are going to be fruitful and productive and long lived. You know, this is supposed to be a low stress, fun activity. Uh, if you haven't watched this documentary, I strongly recommend The Permaculture Orchard. Um, that's a really fun, great ideas. Here's some of my friends, John Bunker and Laura Seeger. Laura is the 
Mofka Heritage Orchard Coordinator. I have exchanged a lot of cool ideas with Bunk and Laura. Uh, we just have fun talking about our favorite varieties of apples, uh, which varieties are more resilient or susceptible to different insects and diseases and how they perform in different climate and soil situations. Um, here I was talking about John Bunker's functional orchard. He basically like clear cut the trees, left the stumps and planted the apples just amidst the stumps and brought in companion plants, comfrey, tamsy, yarrow, but allowed a lot of bracken fern and, you know, wild main forest understory species to spring up. And, you know, there's some like silky dogwoods, red, red osier. Uh, so it's just kind of fun to a uh, fun way. And then uh, with some of his interns, they built a hugel culture mound out of some of the slash and branches of the forestry project and put compost over the top of that chickens so that they can eventually plant trees and berries into the hugel mounds. Uh, and then I like this book. So everything that I'm talking about today, I've learned a lot. I, uh, from this book Nance, by Nancy and John, John came to one of my pruning workshops. Someone asked about spraying fruit trees with, in, with pesticides, insecticides and fungicides. Ultimately like spraying insecticide is poison and it does mo more harm than good and the tree becomes reliant on it. So I'm trying to offer you man, uh, ways to take care of your trees without spraying poison. And that's something that Nancy and John talk about in this book. And you kind of just have to accept that there's going to be a certain amount of damage to your fruits and your vegetables because the ecosystem is going to balance itself out. Um, something that's going on in the orchard this time of the year, if you have fruit trees, is thinning the crop. If all of your trees flowered and all of the flowers got visited by bees and flies and um, moths, then the pollinate cross-pollination happened and the fruits the seed embryo inside the fruits is starting to size up and you're going to see small pea, pea to marble sized fruitlets on your trees growing in clusters. Those clusters of fruits are gonna be where insects and diseases are looking. They want the same thing as us from the fruit, they want the sugar. So by using these sticky traps, this is a way that we can monitor insect pest populations, uh, apple maggot fly, fruit flies, uh, just Sophila, uh, caterpillars, um, even adult female borer, you know, moths and wasps, the codling moth traps have a pheromone that helps attract them. Uh, hanging the red ball traps. These are using these insect traps. Uh, these are the, um, these are go ideally get deployed, hung from the tree uh, around the time of petal fall. And that's when insects are going to start coming out and look, you know, uh, laying eggs into small fruitlets. Um, so by setting out the sticky traps, the red balls and the uh, yellow sticky traps, we can start decreasing some of those caterpillar and uh, apple maggot fly uh, populations so that our fruit's not all buggy. Um, this statement. Uh, is from extension. It's kind of the extension approach. I don't like to cut down all of the wild and untended trees around the woods edge, um, but just from a somewhat conventional mindset, um, you know, if you have an economic valued crop, having these wild trees uh, is, has a potential to increase your pest and disease pressure. Um, but I incorporated this because uh, the effect of hand thinning the fruit crop can help decrease insect pests and it can also help you increase the quality of your fruit crop. So when you have like a, um, a big cluster of fruitlets, many fruitlets growing together, you're going to have insects like getting in in between the fruits. So you can, if you have a cluster of three to five fruitlets, I would thin the cl fruit clusters down to one or two or three fruitlets. It can be a hard thing to do. You're like, why am I throwing away all these baby apples and peaches and pears that could become excellent. But the fruit that you leave on the tree is going to be larger and sweeter and more colored. Like you're gonna get a higher quality crop from doing the thinning just by pinching those fruitlets off by hand. 
Now uh, I added these pictures. On the left, we have a tent caterpillar. On the right, we have spongy moths. Um, one of them is a native insect. One of them is uh, introduced and opportunistic. They both want to eat the leaves off of your trees. Um, with these guys, it's easy to just take a stick and just rub them off, gather the, gather the nest material, gather the fuzz, gather the caterpillars, and just crush them up, put them in a bucket of soapy water, burn them, put them in your compost pile, but there's no reason to spray them if you can see them. But once again, you have to go out in your orchard and scout and look for the insects, insects because they can be very small. Um, here, this slide is showing the difference between an apple scab ascospore lesion and a plum curculio, which is a type of weevil that likes to lay its eggs in the fruit and it makes an incision, inserts its eggs in there and then leaves a little half, not quite full moon, half moon shaped kind of scar uh, on the fruit. It's harmless, you can eat it, but uh, if multiple uh, curculio eggs get left in the fruit, it can cause that fruit to abort and then it will fall off the tree when it's time for June drop. Um, and then, you know, by doing sanitation in June when the, the fruitlets that didn't get fully pollinated leaves and fruit start falling off, just raking them up and doing good orchard sanitation can really help decrease your insect larval and uh, pest generation and also decrease your disease pressure. Uh, here, this is showing the different, uh, showing what uh, European apple sawfly can do to an apple, and these fruits are not going to ripen up to full maturity. Um, the European apple sawfly can, you know, it make the adult makes that slice on the fruit, lays its eggs, and then the larval stage eats around on the inside of the fruit and bores its way out as an adult. The picture on the right is a picture of a parasilla, which is a very small little beetle that loves to lay its eggs and eat in the, um, or not a beetle fly, and eat in the fruit. And that pear, little pear fruitlet is going to fall off. Um, codling moth is another pest of orchards in Maine that can make the fruit all wormy. Um, if you're not, if you know, one of the methods for managing this pest is by using these uh, um, coddling moth traps and lures, which look like I would call them like Chinese food takeout boxes that you hang from the tree, and the adult moth flies in there and gets stuck on the sticky stuff. Some of them will do it without a trap lure, but there is like a pheromone lure which can help. Uh, if you have a high population of them, it's not going to, uh, you know, kill the entire population. You will still have some damage, but it's better than spraying a broad spectrum insecticide. Uh, this is one of the biggest problems and killers of young fruit trees in New England, and that is the round-headed apple borer. There's also a black borer, there's a hawthorn borer, there's a flat-headed peach borer, but by far the round-headed apple borer is the most devastating. Uh, it's the adult is flying around with wings now, uh, or in June laying eggs, and the larvae get to be these fat grubs with round heads, and they eat the cambium and vascular tissue inside of the trunk of the tree, usually from the soil line up about six inches. And you'll start, you might see a little bit of reddish brownish sawdust on the base of the trunk of the tree. It's easier to see that if you put the whitewash trunk paint on. Uh, and then you can go in with a very sharp uh, utility knife or scalpel and very carefully surgically extract those larvae or take a paper clip and stick the paper clip up into the hole until you have uh, poked the larva because these little bugs will definitely kill your trees. In orchards where insecticide is being sprayed, they're not so much of an issue, but in home orchards um, and unsprayed trees, they definitely do a lot of damage. And uh, one of my teachers was talking about, if you, if you have more trees then you can really uh, do all of this uh, surgical removal of these borers, 
you can get a beneficial nematode and smear that into the trunk with some clay and wrap that with like coconut core or burlap and the nematodes will kill those borers for you. Uh, here's that European apple sawfly. They can uh, decrease the val like the cosmetic value of fruit and potentially make fruit fall off the tree. Um, but for home orchards, they're not really that big of a problem. You know, you just can't, you know, they're kind of a pest because you can't sell the fruit for as much money or whatever, but it'd be fine in cider or for home eating. Uh, the, the potato leaf hoppers have become a bigger problem in apple trees and pear trees. They uh, really want to suck the juices out of those leaves, especially like young leaves with, with trees that had nitrogen fertilizer and the wound from their piercing sucking mouth parts creates an opening in the leaves and the shoots where uh, fungi and bacteria can get in and cause um, an infection in the tree. And there is particularly a uh, correlation between potato leaf hopper damage and fire blight that is striking and burning down the shoots and leaves of apple and pear trees. So I look for this uh, marginal leaf burning and leaf curling and paleness all around the leaf edges and that can be a sign that there are potato leaf hoppers that are chewing and sucking the juices on your apple tree leaves. Um, there's a lot of information to know about them. There's a lot of other insects that they can be confused with, but they generally start to be active around petal fall. So uh, going out scouting, squishing, definitely putting out uh, yellow sticky cards and red, uh, red ball traps with tangled tangle trap uh, on it can definitely help catch a bunch of them uh, so that there's less of them um, damaging the leaves. On the left, that is the larval stage of the oblique banded leaf roller, which is a insect pest that can, um, it's a type of moth that can damage fruit tree leaves. On the right is just a green fruit worm. There are many different species of green caterpillars that like to eat the leaves of fruit trees. Um, winter moth, pug moth, oriental fruit moth are generally just like little green caterpillars. Uh, if there's like a whole bunch of them, then, you know, like squishing them. But anytime I see those little dudes, I generally just pinch them between my thumb, and my finger and make some bug juice. Um, brown marmorated stink bug can cause damage to fruit tree leaves and fruits. They're kind of nasty. You can trap them with a vinegar trap. I don't think I put a recipe for vinegar trap in here, um, but that is, these dudes are nasty. I, they're pretty easy. Like if you put down a tarp or a paper bag underneath your tree, if there's a bunch of stink bugs on it, you can just shake the branch and they will just fall off and you can get them and dispose of them appropriately. Uh, I put this slide in here. I, um, this is the best source that I have found for br uh, bringing beneficial insects uh, into your farm and gardens. There may be other sources out there, but they are pretty readily available. And I have used lace wings, praying mantises, uh, and um, ladybugs. I haven't used the mite predators or the assassin bugs. And I, ha I have used the nematodes. The nematodes, so with these things, uh, releasing them at the right time of year, usually around petal fall, like maybe like mi mid to end of when the trees are flowering and you kind of have to estimate when that approximate date is gonna be so you can order them and get them shipped to you. But they can help decrease some of those insect pest populations that really want to feed and damage on your trees. Um, thinking about plant. So that's most of what I'm gonna say about insects for now. There's more insects that I didn't cover, but those are some of the big ones. Um, and talking about diseases, I know Hillary's gonna tell me that I'm gonna be going over time soon, um, but most of the diseases that infect fruit trees are gonna be f fungal. Viruses are rare, um, but they are out there. And then bacteria, there's not too many of them, but the ones that do infect fruit trees 
uh, is basically a death, death sentence. There's not really a holistic way to manage a uh, bacterial infection of a fruit tree. Fungi, um, so the best, so fire blight is newer. It's historically a Southern disease, but it's a bacterial disease that is coming up to Maine with climate change. And we have been pruning it out of orchards more and more every year. Um, you'll start to notice it this time of year after, you know, in the few weeks after petal fall, uh, you'll start to see uh, wilting shoot tips, leaf burn, the shepherd's crook, um, and you may start to see uh, cankers. Uh, all of these uh, symptoms of fire blight should be pruned out as soon as possible, and the um, pruning cut should be made at least 18 inches below where the visible symptom of the infection is. And using the ugly stub pruning method, which is contrary to all of the good pruning lessons that we've learned over the years. You don't want to make a good pruning cut during the summer. You want to leave that stub because if you cut back to the branch collar on the trunk, uh, the fire blight infection will spread into the main trunk of the tree. So by leaving like a three or four inch stub that will allow the chance to heal and compartmentalize the infection and decrease the risk that the fire blight infection will spread into the main trunk of the tree and kill the tree. But very aggressive pruning is the best method for managing fire blight in orchards, whether you're spraying uh, bacteria side or antimicrobial product or not. Uh, it's going to be increasingly difficult to take care of fruit trees without spraying because of the increasing um, incidence of fire blight. So you, uh, it may behoove you to spend some time learning about uh, spraying and managing for fire blight. We're not going to talk about that today. Powdery mildew is a common disease. It comes with high humidity in our climate. Uh, once again, with most of these foliar and powdery mildew is a fungal disease, as is frog's eye leaf spot. With many of these diseases, just good pruning and good balanced fertilization of the trees. Like if all of those micronutrients are in place and there's plentiful Bi beneficial biological microorganisms in the soil, the trees are going to be more re resilient, more resistant even to some of these airborne fungal diseases. Um, and thracnose is pretty common. I see it a lot on the branches of apple and pear trees. Uh, it comes from roses. It infects a lot of different plants in this family of plants and uh, it should be pruned out to remove the anthracnose. Um, black rot canker is very common. It removes the um, bark and decays the trunk of the tree. It particularly can infect if, you, if there has been a large diameter pruning cut made on the end of a scaffold branch and there's exposed heartwood. That is most often the entry point for the black rot canker and it will spread down the scaffold of the tree. Uh, so the best management practice, if whether or not you're going to spray, is just to prune out these disease infections, and they're going to be noticeable usually during the month of June. Um, so that's when I'm walking around scouting, looking for infections, and a, you know using my pruning tools. Whether if it's a small diameter branch, I can do a lot of pruning with my hand pruners. If it's a larger diameter branch infection, I'm going to use a hand saw or a pole saw to remove that. Uh, just being careful to make a good clean cut uh, with a flat healing surface so that the tree can form callus tissue and cover the wounded area to prevent further infection from spreading into the tree. Uh, here's the apple and thracnose again with its characteristic fiddle string fiber where it has killed the cambium tissue under the bark and you see this kind of like stringiness poking out from both ends a wound. Um, 
if that happens on a branch, you prune off the branch back to a bud or a viable lateral branch. If it happens on the main trunk of the tree, um, you may have to top the tree and cut off that larger portion. You just have to be careful about when you do that. With anthracnose, if you have an anthracnose canker on the trunk of your tree, I would not recommend topping your tree midsummer, but I would flag that with bright flagging tape and come back and make that pruning cut in the winter so that the tree has a better chance of healing without the infection spreading into the main trunk of the tree. If you have peach trees, cherry trees, uh, plum trees, black, black knot fungus is very common. It looks like charcoal growths growing on the branches that can be pruned out any time of year. Um, pruning out now, a lot of these diseases spread when there's a, it's warm and there's a rain event and the, spl the wa splashing water droplets from the rain will spread the spores and the bacterial, well, yeah, the fungal spores uh, to other branches and other trees. So if you observe black knot fungus, you can prune that out of your trees now. If you observe brown rot uh, forming on your fruits. This is common on all stone fruit in the prunus family, cherries, plums, peaches, nectarines. Um, that once it's there, it's difficult to, you can't get rid of it, but if you can protect your trees by using, um, because they're looking for an acidic pH. Um, so by making sure that your soil pH is balanced. And then if you are thinking about spraying your trees, uh, uh, you can use uh, milk, which has ferroglobulin in it, which prevents fungal spores. And that can help decrease brown rot and powdery mildew. It's not going to have as much of an effect on some of the more virulent uh, plant diseases. Um, or otherwise, you'll have to use a biological fungicide, which there are some options. Uh, and if all of that is too overwhelming and heartbreaking and you can't stay, don't have enough time to take care of your trees, then just have fun, go down to the river, go for a swim, go to the lake, go to the beach. Uh, that's me sitting in the back in a canoe race with my friend, Mark. Uh, we are so excited to reach the finish line of this canoe race because we had capsized three times and we came in last place. And so, that's us having a great time on the river. So thank you for sitting through my long presentation about apple and fruit tree plants, uh, diseases and insects and all of the things that you could spend all of your time doing playing with your trees. I'm gonna go back and check the chat now if we have time and see what folks are interested in diving deeper into while we still have time. So I do yeah. have a list going if you want. If yeah, you want to use that do you list. want to ask me the questions, Hillary? That'd be great, yeah. Um, so a few of them I think have been answered over the course of your presentation. Like for example, someone was talking right at the start about how they have a big issue with um, plum portfolio, <laughs> but I, I know you did touch on that a little bit. Do, is there anything else you want, want to add? Yeah, so I don't know if I emphasize the importance enough of good orchard sanitation, uh, and that's going to decrease your insect and uh, disease pressure. So raking up fallen fruitlets and leaves both midsummer and then again in the fall and just getting all of that disease inoculum and insect larva out is going to ha allow you to have healthier trees and not have to spend as much time managing those pests when they come into the orchard. Um, but as far as I know now, right now, the most effective management strategy for plum curculios is the beneficial nematodes that are applied uh, and they will kill the, the plum curculios larvae in, the, in their soil stage. Um, mm. So that, that's one thing. And there's other products that you can spray, but I'm trying to steer away from that spraying. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's great. Do you fill those buckets with water to like drown them or do you burn, like what do you do when you pick up all those drops? Yeah, so when you pick up dropped fruits and leaves, uh, 
if you are making compost at home, I would dig a hole. So um, what does my friend call it who makes a lot of compost? You put it in the oven. So you open up your compost pile. You like expose the heart of your compost pile. You put your apples, fruitlets, fallen fruitlets and leaves in the, in the oven of your compost pile. And then you cover it back over with all of the other material that was already in your compost. And that's going to help it cook down and get rid of those insects and diseases. Okay. That's cool. the best thing. If put you it don't in the oven. Make, if you don't make compost at home, you can bag it up and take it to a landscape waste yard town, TPW, if that's available to you. I would advise you against just dumping it on the wood's edge because that's not going to reduce your pest pressure. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, someone said that they lost a couple of trees, two cherry and one apple above the graft, and they wondered if they should graft onto the existing rootstock. Yeah, okay. totally. Yeah, so if the rootstock is still alive and it's sending out root suckers or new shoots, you can cultivate and train those to a single, select a single stem, and then you can top work or graft onto that rootstock, the same cultivar or a different cultivar. But I would uh, cut the exist, the old cent central leader that died back to the graft union down to, you know, like a half inch above the wherever that uh, vigorous sucker is growing out, whether that's from the soil line or like from somewhere, you know, in the top 12, in, in the 12 inches of where the rootstock rises out of the ground. Okay, great. There was also one other question about top working. Somebody yeah. said that they wanted to top work a wild tree. Yeah. Um, and how, <laughs> how should they like, I think they said, how should I determine what the rootstock will be like or? Yeah, so the, if you have a wild tree and you're going to cut off the existing top leader of that tree and graft a new cultivar onto it, the mature size of that tree after the new graft has taken is going to be the same size as the old tree was only with a different fruiting cultivar. Cool. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, moving on to another topic. Somebody was asking about whether it's worth removing grass and planting a cover crop in an orchard to add nutrients and avoid competition for the tree. Yeah. Yeah. So, I advise against having sod growing right up to the trunk of your tree. The sod is competing for nutrients with your tree. It is suppressing atmospheric gas exchange. Uh, tree roots need oxygen and the sod is holding carbon dioxide in the soil. So by getting rid of the sod and planting broadleaf, you can plant uh, native plants, you can plant medicinal and culinary herbs. You can even plant vegetables as companion plants. But uh, just having like grass lawn growing right up to the trunks of your trees, that's gonna um, definitely stunt your tree's growth and productivity. So any, but having a, bi a diverse uh, ground cover uh, species mix is going to create an overall health healthier ecosystem. Awesome. Um, and then we had a couple questions about sort of um, cultivating mycorrhizal fungi and um, ramial wood chips. So I guess I yeah. wonder if you would maybe just want to talk a bit about that. One person yeah. said, how do you obtain natural mycorrhizal fungi versus yeah. what's developed in the lab that you can buy? Totally. So that's one thing that Michael Phillips does say you should put this in your planting hole. Go to a healthy forest in your, in your area, preferably an old growth forest or near healthy, mature, old hardwood trees um, and dig up, you know, a couple of scoops of soil from there, a couple of handfuls. I mean, ask permission if you're able to, ask forgiveness if you're not, but undisturbed soil is going to have healthy native uh, beneficial microorganisms that 
when you incorporate that into your planting hole, it's going to connect your newly planted tree with the surrounding environment and the other plants that are already existing there. Um, you can buy different forms of mycorrhiza. Uh, another thing that I didn't talk about is when you're putting down aged wood chip mulch, I inoculate uh, the aged wood chip mulch around some of my fruit trees with uh, edible culinary mushrooms, such as wine cap strafaria and chestnut mushrooms. And that can help break down the wood chips and release nutrients for your fruit trees and also provide, provide a secondary edible crop from the same growing area. Um, but yeah, there are more and more laboratory cultivated beneficial microorganism products out there on the market now. Some of them are higher quality than others. I've been starting to play around with some of them. I honestly can't tell you that I've seen a difference in any of them, but once again, I think a little bit of a good thing goes a long way. Oh, and one person just said chestnut mushroom. And what was the other mushroom you just uh, mentioned? Wine cap strafaria. Awesome. And you can get sawdust spawn or grain spawn of those species from any of, there's like so many, companies that are selling gourmet edible mushroom, uh, you know, growing kits now. So, or if you have, or if you know somebody else who's already growing those things, you can, you know, uh, have a trade, a trade and get some, uh, spawn from their garden too. Uh, I, I will take wine cap mycelium from a wood chip bed that I planted them a few years ago and transplant that into a new wood chip bed or plant tree planting area. And it's really fun when you come back and you uncover mm -hmm. some of the wood chip mulch and you can see the white filament hair, um, the mycelium, you know, growing along the soil surface in between all of the wood chips. It's pretty cool. So cool. Um, uh, we have four questions about specific pests, but I'm going to yeah. do one other one before yeah. we finish off with those four pest questions. Yeah. So um, Ben was asking, could you talk a bit about variety selection and its connection to pest and disease issues and management style? Yeah, definitely. So there are um, a couple of different groups of fruit trees that are considered to have more or less resilience to insect pests and diseases. Um, I will tell you that most of the grocery store available commercial varieties, co commercial cultivars of all fruits are going to be fussy and high maintenance and, and are going to be harder to grow. Uh, some of the old heirloom fruit varieties New World and old, old World are going, some of them may have an elevated amount of disease resistance um, because they were grown before the time of agrochemical dependence. And then there is a newer group of DR, disease resistant uh, fruit trees that have been selectively bred by cooperative extension research stations at different land grant universities um, for like, example, Liberty, uh, Enterprise, Pristine, Gold Rush, Red Free, those are all modern disease resistant apple varieties. Uh, they're going to have more resistance to the major apple diseases, uh, apple scab, cedar, apple rust, powdery mildew. Most of them are not going to have resistance to, because those are all fungal, not going to have resistance to fire blight because fire blight is bacterial. And none of them are going to have uh, noticeably elevated resistance to insects. The, all, all different cultivars are susceptible to insects depending on the both foliar nutrient composition and the soil nutrient availability. So when trees have uh, access to a well-balanced uh, healthy soil fertility, um, they're going to be able to grow healthy cell walls and strong cuticles and be more able to fend or be less attractive to insects. Insects and uh, wildlife that uh, end up like damaging trees, they have a certain, like particularly like yellow-bellied sapsuckers, which drill a lot of poke holes in tree trunks. 
they have a certain sense whether there's a pheromone that's released from the tree or they're able to see it through like infrared vision that the tree is already stressed out. So when the insects and wildlife go and eat some part of the tree, it's because that tree is already expressing some stress signals, uh, which are oftentimes uh, drought, flooding, or soil, soil nutrient imbalance. But then again, some of the heirloom varieties of apples uh, may have been resistant to pest disease, uh, common diseases in the past, but because of climate change may become more susceptible in old age to plant diseases. So it's a little bit of a gamble, mm -hmm. um, but there are definitely certain varieties that are highly susceptible, like all of the, the majority of the European, the French and English cider apples and pears uh, are going to be high maintenance and fussy varieties to grow in our New England climate. Mm. Um, so I often steer folks away from there. I will tell you that my number one favorite apple variety for, for beginners is Gravenstein. Uh, it seems to be widely adaptable to all different growing regions. It's one of the oldest heirloom apples brought to North America from Russia. It makes excellent pink applesauce when you keep the skin on. It's very good for baking. Um, so if you don't have a Gravenstein apple tree, that's one of my favorites. Now, once again, this is extremely personal. You know, Bunk is going to tell you to plant Black Oxford. Laura really loves Rolf and uh, all of these other fun heirloom varieties that are, you know, just from little towns and old homesteads around Maine. Um, Duchess of Oldenburg is an excellent Maine variety uh, that is pretty res resilient. Uh, so you've got some options. Um, and also there's other fun um, resources like orangepippins.com talk talks a lot about like different fruit tree, apple tree qu qualities, characteristics. I don't know if you can see this book is like old school. This is from the Seed Savers Exchange and they talk about many different fruit berry and nut varieties and some of their characteristics. Uh, so this is a good source if you're looking, researching varieties that are worth planting uh, in your landscape. Cool. Um, okay, I'm gonna just give you these four last um, pest questions. It's, I know yeah. I'm just noticing it's seven o'clock. Um, yeah. So totally understand as, as folks need to head out. Um, but if you can stay for a few more minutes, Edgar. Yes. Uh, we'll run through these. Okay, so the first, first person was asking about any controls you know of. Um, they're dealing with peach leaf curl and pear slugs. Yeah, wow. So two different things. So slugs, crawling on the pear tree leaves and branches, I guess, uh, pick those off. It's probably, they're probably attracted. There's probably a humid microclimate there. Um, salt, you could put like uh, salt on some of the lower scaffold branches, I guess, or um, there's a, a insect barrier that I didn't show in my um, slides, but there's a, I think Fed Coast sells it. I think it's called Bug Barrier and it's a trunk wrap. But ultimately you could just wrap like a uh, cardboard around the trunk of your tree and paint the tangle foot sticky compound onto the mm -hmm. cardboard. And that would stop any trunk crawling insects from passing up or down. And slugs mm -hmm. are generally gonna be crawling from like the moist lawn morning dew up to the tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, sorry, peach leaf curl um, is a, it's primarily cosmetic. It can uh, decrease photosynthesis, but there's a couple of different sprays that you can use. You can spray uh, Serenade or Cease, which is back, a Bacillus subtilis uh, biological fungicide, or you can spray a garlic barrier or gar make garlic tea, garlic extract, and uh, that has proven success by spraying garlic on your peach tree leaves at um, diminishing the peach leaf curl. But with both of those things, if you have a tree that already has peach leaf curl this year 
it's too late for those leaves. If you spray that product on, the tree may put out new leaves uh, with a lot of the, and like we're getting into talking about spraying a lot, a little bit now, but a lot of these spray organically approved sprays are crop protectants. So you have to know what your pathogen is gonna be before it causes the infection and get a thorough coating on the tree before that disease infects it. Sometimes just you're predicting you start spraying garlic uh, tea on the pear on the peach trees as soon as it leaves out and keep reapplying. Uh, I'm not sure if the Niwa model has uh, predictions for like peach leaf curl events. Um, but once the tree already has peach leaf curl, you can't like cure it organically. You just have to plan to protect protect it before it happens. Okay, yeah. So if it's already here this year, then you're kind of, you need to start just thinking about how to be ready for next year. But yeah, so then write it down, make a note to yourself, uh, stick it on your calendar, 2023 calendar on January 1st. Like, oh yeah, I have to remember like in May, April, May of 2023, I'm gonna have to spray garlic tea on my peach tree. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, one quick question. I think you mentioned the Apple pest kit. Somebody asked if that yeah. is a Fedco offering. Yeah, that is a Fedco thing. Um, I'll try to find that. That's early on in the presentation. Um, okay. But yeah, Fedco sells this Apple pest kit. It's mostly just like six red Mm -hmm. red ball sticky traps and it comes with the apple maggot lures and the sticky stuff um that just has those six red ball traps um that will do a good job so a cheaper alternative to this go to the grocery store buy red delicious apples stick a coat hanger through them and paint just the tangle trap sticky stuff on those red delicious apples and then that the apple maggot flies and cuddling moths are going to be naturally attracted to the smell of the ripe fruit. And then you don't have to buy the pheromone lures. You just have to buy the tree tangle foot and paint that on the apple. Because when you buy these red ball traps at the end of the year, they have, they're sticky and they have gross dead bugs on them. And you have to take, you have to soak them in alcohol and take a knife and scrape all the sticky off. It's a lot easier to just use the, red delicious apples from the grocery store and throw those away at the end of the season. Great. Thanks, Edgar. Mm -hmm. um, there was one other question about pe peach leaf curl. One person yeah. just wanted to know, like, how serious is it? Is it a death sentence for a peach tree? Yeah, no, it's not a death sentence. It's primarily if it's if it's only like infecting a certain stage of growth, usually like the mid stage of the first leaves, like it's mostly cosmetic. If it can, it can cause defoliation of peach trees, but if you're irrigating your peach tree, then it's going to be able to refoliate. But if it gets defoliated every year, it's definitely going to shorten the life of the tree. Mm. So it's definitely not like it's peach leaf curl is not as bad as fire blight. Understanding that like the average peach tree in New England doesn't live for longer than 10 years. Like I've heard eight to 15 years. Mm -hmm. Some folks have, you know, if you have a cold climate and you get, you know, some folks I've heard of like red, red haven peach trees dying from winter cold. You really want to seek out the most cold hardy varieties of peach trees. So like um, Garnet Beauty, uh, any of the Paul Friday, if you get, there's like peach trees that have the PF, like letters in their name like those are from a breeding program in minnesota where they're extremely cold hardy uh reliance is reliance usually lives through cold main winters but you know like if it warms up and then it goes down to negative 20 for three nights like you're probably gonna that tree's probably gonna die back to the ground so it's peace trees are fun but a little bit of a gamble okay great and um i'm gonna throw one more or I think two people actually were asking about cherry trees being attacked by Japanese beetles and um and one of those people said rose chafers any advice on okay. that I don't know about rose chafers I can look that up Japanese beetles are really easy to just shake off the tree especially in the early in the morning or late in the evening if you just put down a tarp or paper bags or something cardboard and just shake the tree the japanese beetles will usually fall off 
Mm -hmm. um the japanese beetles life cycle like they have the grubs in the grass so the japanese beetles are probably coming to your cherry tree they're probably coming out of your lawn um and they're going there because there's not enough organic matter so part of that might be spreading compost spray uh you know watering with compost tea but just shaking them off of the tree and then you know crushing crushing them or putting them crushing uh, or you can do biodynamic ashing and like actually like burning the beetles and then spreading the ash around the tree. Like some folks have done that and seen less insects coming to their gardens. Um, it's a little bit uh, out there, but it, I've heard that it works. I personally haven't tried it, but hmm. worth worth a shot. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. So are you saying that there's inadequate organic matter in the soil and that's why the- That would be my guess. Like I've read a lot of stuff. People were talking about like milky spore and these other products that are like, you can buy at the garden center to like kill Japanese beetles, but Japanese beetles are coming to your yard because there's a hospitable environment and it has something to do with the grass and sod. So if you have a like green lawn, uh, you know, if you- uh, aerate your lawn and spread compost and uh, seed in like OVN or other like clover rye fescue and have a mixed grass instead of just like a straight what is that like Kentucky bluegrass like lawn they're going to be more attracted to that I mean that's part of the reason why golf courses have to spray so much insecticide and fungicide in all of their turf so yeah um oh and I think yeah, that was all the pest questions. One last question, Renee is asking, when pruning out fire blight, do you need to disinfect your snips between each cut or between each tree? Yeah, so um, depends how many trees you have and how many trees you're working on. Uh, I would at least, if you only, if you only have one, tr so yes and no. Some people say, yes, always disinfect your pruning tools in between every cut. I've done that. I pruned an orchard this winter with over 300 trees with fire blight and I just could not, like it was not realistic to disinfect my tools in between every cut or even every tree. I disinfect my tools at like at the end of each job so that when I go to prune somebody else's trees, I'm not going to be transporting diseases from one orchard to another. Um, but if you are, if you have fire blight, you probably have to spray some form of pest, pesticide material to get the fire blight, blight under control to keep your fruit tree alive. So in that scenario, it, it, you don't, if you are definitely going to spray, then you don't have to sanitize your tools at all, or at least not between trees. Uh, if you really are trying not to spray, then you definitely should san disinfect your tools in between every cut because you can transfer fire blight bacteria to parts of the tree that are not already infected. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, and <laughs> last question. With what do you usually do your disinfecting? Yeah, so um, I when I'm with my toolkit of pruning tools, I keep a spray bottle of hydrogen peroxide and a spray bottle of 91% isopropyl alcohol, um, or you can get like bleach wipes. Um, but yeah, yeah. The, some folks don't like the hydrogen peroxide because it dries out your skin and turns it white, and it can make your tools like rusty. So the pruners don't like. Uh, uh, aren't as like bouncy. So mm -hmm. isopropyl alcohol works pretty good. And then I just loop after that, after I'm like doing a job where I have to disinfect, like uh, I will just add some like uh, lubricant, like three in one oil or something to my pruning tools so that they're not, you know, like stuck from that disinfectant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. This has been really awesome. And lots of thanks coming into the chat. Cool. Yeah, really grateful that you're here tonight, Edgar, and that and that all of you have joined in and asked so many good questions. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. I'm sorry I talked so much, but I hope somebody <laughs> learned something. 
I think lots of people learn lots of things. Cool. And talking is the point. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Hillary. Um, Thanks everyone. Cool. Thanks a lot, everyone.